Maisie Dobbs shuffled the papers on her desk into a neat pile and placed them in a plain manila folder. She took up a green marbled patterned W. H. Smith fountain pen and inscribed the cover with the name of her new clients, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Johnson, who were concerned that their son's fiancée might have misled them regarding her past. It was the sort of case that was easily attended to, that would provide a useful reference, and that could be closed with presentation of a timely report and accompanying account for her services. But for Maisie, the case notes would not be filed away until those whose lives were touched by her investigation had reached a certain peace with her findings, with themselves and with one another, as far as that might be possible. As she wrote, a tendril of jet-black hair tumbled down into her eyes. Sighing, she quickly pushed it back into the chignon at the nape of her neck. Suddenly, Maisie set her pen on the blotting pad, pulled the troublesome wisp of hair free so that it hung down again, and walked to the large mirror hanging on the wall above the fireplace. She unpinned her long hair and tucked it inside the collar of her white silk blouse, pulling out just an inch or so, around her chin line. Would shorter hair suit her? Perhaps Lady Rowan is right, said Maisie to her reflection in the mirror. Perhaps it would look better in a bob. She turned from side to side several times and lifted her hair just slightly. Shorter hair might save a few minutes of precious time each morning, and it would no longer come free of the chignon and fall into her eyes. But one thing held her back— she lifted her hair and turned her head. Was the scar visible? Would shorter hair fall in such a way as to reveal the purple wheel that etched a line from her neck into the sensitive flesh of her scalp? If her hair were cut, would she lean forward over her notes one day and unwittingly allow a client to see the damage inflicted by the German shell that had ripped into the casualty clearing station where she was working in France in 1917. Looking at the room reflected in the mirror, Maisie considered how far she had come, not only from the dark, dingy office in Warren Street that was all she had been able to afford just over a year ago, but from that first meeting with Maurice Blanche, her mentor and teacher, when she had been a maid in the household of Lord Julian Compton and his wife, Lady Rowan. It was Morris and Lady Rowan who had noted Maisie's intellect and ensured that she had every opportunity to pursue her hunger for education. They had made it possible for the former tweeny maid to gain admission to Girton College, Cambridge. Maisie quickly pulled her hair into a neat chignon again, and as she pinned the twist into place, she glanced out of the floor-to-ceiling window that overlooked Fitzroy Square. Her assistant, Billy Beale, had just turned into the square and was crossing the rain-damp grey flagstones toward the office. Her scar began to throb. As she watched Billy, Maisie began to assume his posture. She moved toward the window with shoulders dropped, hands thrust into imaginary pockets, and her gait mimicking the awkwardness caused by Billy's still troublesome war wounds. Her disposition began to change, and as she realized, the occasional malaise she had sensed several weeks ago was now a constant in Billy's life.